Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Meepleville Meets. This week, we are so honored to have the designer of the winner of numerous awards, but one of the biggest games in the past couple of years, Wingspan. Please welcome Elizabeth Hargrave. Hey there. How are you doing? Good, good. Yeah, it's so good to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. I really, really appreciate it. Thanks for uh, having me. Yeah, so now, of course, we're going to talk about Wingspan because it has just taken over the gaming world and i'm I, I, that's got to feel fantastic right i mean it's yeah it's, it's been pretty fun <laughs> it's incredible so we're gonna go ahead and yeah. get that but the thing that's really exciting is in just a couple of weeks i believe it's in august you have a brand new game coming out yeah probably closer to the end of august but yeah i have a game called mark Postons out that's about the migration of monarch butterflies oh okay well, if you could do us a little bit of favor and tell us um, about the game in particular, sure. uh, the gameplay, and um, who it's kind of like suited for. Yeah, so um, the, the game plays out on a map of the Eastern US, and it's based on the actual migration patterns of monarch butterflies. So they spend the winter in this tiny little patch of central Mexico, like 14 mountainsides um, in, in the state of Michoacan. And they um, migrate north for the summer. So they spread out across all of Eastern North America. And then every fall they go back to Mexico. And so the game sort of mimics that in the gameplay. So you play over three seasons and in the spring, there are a bunch of interchangeable goals, but the goals generally are pushing people to to get their butterflies further north and to start reproducing. And then in the summer, you're spreading out across the board and in the fall, it's a big race back south. And so there's some set collection as your butterflies are moving around on the board because um, where you land, you pick up the flower that you land on and you're turning those in to make more butterflies. Um, and there's all sort of a, a meta level set collection when you visit different cities around North America, um, you can pick up uh, little cards that then can add up into a set that give you a power for the rest of the game. Um, yeah, oh. but the turns are super simple. I was aiming because of the theme, I wanted it to be pretty accessible to families. So on your turn, you just you have two um, different movement cards to choose from. And you're just picking one of those. So it might be one that lets you move a whole bunch of spaces, but get fewer flowers or one that lets you move less, but but get more stuff. Um, so you're just picking between two cards and and then thinking about on the, the hex map of North America, sort of what do those two cards let you do? So that's really where the depth is, is in making everything fit together with the map and, and being able to get to the spots where you can make more butterflies and, and things like that. Um, but the rules are pretty, pretty simple. It sounds very good. So I'm sure, um, people who like love wingspan, um, I, did you necessarily design it for that same type of audience or is it, would, would somebody play it and maybe say, oh, this is kind of like wingspan. I could see it from Elizabeth or this is completely different. What would they I, feel like playing the game? I think partly it depends what you like about wingspan whether it's you'll see the similarities or not like thematically definitely right like i think there will be a lot of resonance between all the birders that have picked up wingspan and and people who want to play a game about butterflies um and i think in the spirit of like there's no take that it's a very friendly game just kind of thinky um doing the best you can with what you've got i think that will feel very similar but the fact that you have pieces that you're moving around on the board and and um, there's still a little bit of engine building because of the cards I mentioned that can add up into giving you a power for the rest of the game, but much less engine building than Wingspan where every bird is really building you towards something. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now also, can you maybe um, educate the audience a little bit and let us know how, um, for example, bringing the game to market works? Because uh, yeah. I, I believe Wingspan, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but was that your first game? That was my first game. Yeah. Wow. You should just stop there, Elizabeth. <laughs> 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 it's just fantastic. Uh, but anyway, so my, my kind of question is, is 
So uh, that was produced or published by Stonemeyer Games. Right. And Mary Poltas is coming out by AEG. So explain to me or the audience also why or, you know, just the thought process going into it, how, yeah. why you went here with Stonemeyer, now you're going with AEG, and a little bit of how that all works. Yeah. Um, I think there's a couple reasons. First of all, so Wingspan came out at the beginning of last year, right? At, at the beginning of 2019. I submitted Mariposas to AEG in the fall of 2018, specifically in response to a call that they had put out for women designers. They really wanted to add some women to their catalog because they didn't have any. Um, I guess they had point salad on the way at that point, so which which has one out of their three designers is is a woman. But um, so I I appreciated that they did that call. I wanted to support that idea. Um, at the time, we had no idea that Wingspan was going to be a big hit, um, but they liked Mariposas. Um, so that was kind of how that ended up with AEG. It was certainly nothing about not wanting to work with Stonemeyer. And, you know, obviously I have continued to do a lot with Stonemeyer because we were going to keep working on expansions for oh, the foreseeable sure. future, right? For Wingspan. Um, but Stonemeyer has a much, um, smaller set of games that they put out every year. They really focus on maybe, you know, one or two games plus some expansions for their existing games for, for the year. Um, and I think Mary Plus is also going to be a little lighter than sort of your typical Stonemeyer game. Um, so, um, I mean, it's not, it's not super light, but I, I think if I had worked with Jamie on it, he would have wanted to make it a little heavier. So. A little meteor. Okay. So technically, yeah. then, um, AEG, you had already sold a game, in essence, to AEG then before Wingsman. It was almost simultaneous oh, <laughs> that they were making that decision. I don't think we had signed the contract yet before Wingsman went um came out to retail but or not to retail but w went for sale on the Stonemeyer website but um but yeah it was sort of in in process already by the time Wingspan oh, okay. came out yeah right. and then and then also um so since they were simultaneous now and again Wingspan is just you know taken over is there a sort of um how does how does it work for people approaching you as far as publishers? And and what I mean is like so of course you're not just like me, right? Some Joe Blow wanting to submit a game. You're now Elizabeth Hargrave, the the right. winner of numerous awards with this fantastic game. So are a lot of people knocking on your door? Do you still have to get it? How does how does all that process work now for you? I have definitely had publishers reach out to me and be like, do you have anything you want to pitch to us? We'd be you know, very happy to look at it. It's still definitely a pitching process. Like they're not going to take just anything, but, but yeah, people have reached out to me for sure. It's a, it's a totally different ballpark than when I had to, you know, for Wingspan, I was just sending cold emails out to people I had never met before asking them to meet with me at Gen Con. So it's, yeah, it's a very different world. Yeah, but it's let me tell you, it's well deserved because uh, such a fine quality product. Um, now let's talk a little bit about obvious the theme with uh, wildlife, uh, wingspan, mariposas. Um, how is that part of you? A part of a part of Elizabeth Hargrave? How is that a part of you? And why did you want to bring that into gaming? I mean, it's just a personal interest of mine in general. I'm a birder. I'm an outdoor enthusiast. I have a big flower garden, so we get lots of butterflies. Um, yeah, it's something I care about. And it's, you know, Wingspan really came about because I was a little bit disenchanted with a lot of the themes of games I was playing. I had already been, you know, playing hobby board games for probably somewhere between five and 10 years at that point. And, and, just kind of going like, why all the games about castles and trains? Like, what? true. <laughs> right? Why is there yeah. nothing that I care about? And I think, you know, even within the time span that I've been working on Wingspan, a lot of stuff has coming up, has come out that maybe like if I were sitting down to thinking about that now, like, would I have had that same like burning, like, I need to make a game because there's no game that I want to play thematically. 
I don't know, like a, a lot of good stuff has come out. I think that a lot of publishers are realizing that there's just a lot more room to play with than the than the sort of safe, tried and true stuff that that they've gone with traditionally. No, absolutely. And it's, and it's one of those kind of things. I mean, um, like you said, you know, about castles and knights and the Mediterranean, all that kind of stuff. And it's, it's one of those kind of things where, you know, me as a gamer or publishers or companies have these blinders on and you might, they might be thinking like a game of birds. No, like let's have people fighting dragons. Let's have trade in the Mediterranean. Right, right. Wow. Right, and that's like part of the whole supply issue with Wingspan last year was all the distributors sort of when, when and I think some retailers when Jamie Stegmeyer from Stonemeyer Games reached out to them and said like we have this game coming out it's about birds it's from a first time artist like how many copies should I print and they were all like oh aim low we're not sure about that you know <laughs> right so. yeah I can definitely see that so speaking of that real quick since. Wingspan has had the multiple and multiple and multiple print runs. And like you said at first, people are like, ah, birds, nah, we don't really want to order that. And, you know, the popularity. What have what lessons have you learned? Um, or is it strictly the publisher? And what is the anticipated print run of Mariposas coming out now due to the success of uh, your game Wingspan? You know, I actually don't know. I know that AEG did something different where they actually asked retailers, maybe you saw this come through, they asked retailers to to put in estimates of how many copies they thought they would sell You're guaranteed uh, be before they went to print, which yeah. is not common, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, so that was kind of how they handled it was, um, you know, they were able at least to have the benefit of knowing that this was coming on the heels of Wingspan and that there was a chance that there would be more demand. Right, right. Um, so I don't know. We'll see how things go in August. But um, but I know they did try to do something a little different to try and estimate the print run. I just don't actually know what the, the final answer was. Right. Well, I'm, gonna tell you. Right. I'm kinda I'm glad I don't have to worry about that stuff. I'm very mm -hmm. happy to leave it to other people because I don't know how I mean it's it's very much a crystal ball and it's a big risk for publishers because you know they're committing to a print run six months before they sell a single copy and it's it's got to be scary so so yeah it is so it is i mean it has to be you're absolutely right yeah. so then let me ask you about that since um at this point you're kind of admitting or saying or like wow i really don't know um it's sort of out of my hands now yeah. so before it got to that point how much of what you gave AEG to what it is now has changed? Like how much did they take on and transform Mariposas? That's a good question. I would say the the core of the game is extremely similar. The map's almost identical. You know, the way that butterflies move around and, and reproduce and all of that is very, very similar. We worked in development. I, I worked with a developer there who's on staff at AEG um, on the end of round goals. And the thing I was talking about where like if you go to cities, you pick up um, little life cycle cards that, that add up to special powers. Um, those were really the things that got added in development. And they were things that actually, when I submitted the game, you know, there was a deadline for this call for proposals. And so when I submitted the game, I was like, I think I still need to work on the end of round goals and, you know, there could be more added to it. So it kind of went into the pitch knowing that, that it probably would go through some more development. And we spent several months on that um, and then probably wrapped that up around the end of last year and again you know it's it's over six months between the time that we we wrapped it up and the time that it'll actually come to retail there's just a, a long lag for the manufacturing and the shipping oh yeah. and then of course they they also you know contracted an amazing artist and so like one of the other things i'm glad i don't really have to do with is that, oh, that, the is that the publishers find these amazing artists and can commission the art so you know i sent them something that i just kind of through together to, you know, that was workable, but certainly not beautiful. And, and it comes back in this amazing polished form. Right. So, but okay. So is, is there anything that sort of broke your heart that maybe they're like, nah, sorry, Elizabeth, we're going to like take this out. You know what I mean? Like when you delivered your product or are you yeah. like really happy? Is it really like what you had envisioned and hoped for? Oh no, I'm super happy with how it came out, and and you know I I like everything we added. Furthermore, so yeah, 
Oh, very good. And how about, um, we'll, we'll talk about some of that other stuff later because I want to know what you have in development and all that other kind of stuff. Uh, but yeah, so what is the exact release date, if you can go ahead and tell the audience of Mariposa, when they can expect it in retail stores? It's it's toward the end of August. I want to say like the 28th. I should have looked that up before I came on with you. Sorry. <laughs> but I'm, I'm pretty sure it's like the 27th, 28th, somewhere in there, right at the, right at the end of the month. Okay, because uh, and, and AEG will be putting you know more stuff out over the next several weeks, I, right? I know, so. Because it was scheduled to be a Gen Con release, correct? It was right. So I think with this release date, they just kind of built in a little bit more time for them to to um, figure out what the heck to to do. Because you know, for months and months, we weren't even sure which way Gen Con was going to go because they couldn't you know lock in the cancellation until late and. It's, you know, until pretty recently, it was unclear how much, whether, you know, some stores might be able to do events. And I think now it's just clear with everything with the pandemic, like, I don't know. I'm, <laughs> we'll, we'll see what we can do that's fun. I know I'm going to go, like, AEG does this live stream um, where they play Tiny Towns and, and Space Base online. And, and um, I've already gone on and, and done it once with them where you can play along Tiny Towns, right? Because an infinite number of people can play with tiny, tiny Towns at the same time. And so they have people come on and you can play along with them. So I'll, I'll do that with them a, a couple more times and, and other things where we're just like trying to get the word out and and, uh, and have, have some fun with people around it. So. Right, very good. And how how does the continuing development process go? And what I mean by that is, for instance, you already have an expansion out for Wingspan, and as you said, mm -hmm. you will have others to come. Um, so, is it the cart before the horse? Like, do the do the expansions come because there's a demand, or is that already in the plan? That's a good question. Um, I think it's a little bit of both. I mean, with Wingspan, it's it's funny because there's sort of this natural structure that that we chose to follow of like I want to do birds from every continent, so we'll do one expansion for each continent. Oh, that, yeah. um, <laughs> so that's a little bit of a like an artificial construct in sense of like, is there demand for that? You know, like I just want to do the birds from the different parts of the world. Um, but there, I mean, there's definitely demand and certainly, you know, Stonemaier's already announced that the next one is Oceania. So like Australia, New Zealand, right, that part right. of the world. And, and I would say I have probably heard from Australians and Kiwis more than anywhere else that they really want to see their birds. And who can blame them? They have amazing birds. Yes. It's going to be really fun. Yeah. Uh, are we going to have a moo in there and an ostrich? Um, ostriches are Africa. Ostriches are, oh, what is yeah. it, the emus and the yeah. cassowaries? The, em the emus and cassowaries, yeah, and then crazy parrots and cockatiels. Like a lot of birds that people think of as pet birds right. are originally from that part of the world, so. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were real excited. I mean, uh, I've got, I don't know, I think I got two dozen copies ordered for my shop. of nice. uh, class. So, yeah, so, no, we're real excited about having that. Uh, yeah, awesome. Yeah, so, no, it's really, really good. So, another thing I wanted to talk to you about, Elizabeth, is you are very um, proactive with social issues. And especially since the... Um, death of George Floyd, there has been the Black Lives Matter movements, there have been a big social issue change uh, or call to action around that in society. But even before that, you were very, very vocal with women in gaming and making sure about representation and stuff like that. So I'd like you to maybe tell us a little bit about how, um, how it all came about. Was it because, in essence, all of a sudden, hey, now I'm Elizabeth Hargrave, I have a platform, I can now be heard to help, or were you already doing this sort of stuff? It's something I was talking about before Wingspan came out, for sure. Um, just from my experience going to game events and especially playtesting events, excuse me, um, because there are so few women in game design and it is just weird to me like i worked in a field that was probably more than 50 percent women and so com coming to game events and walking into a room and being like the only woman there is very 
alarming to me almost. It's like, what, what, like, this just doesn't happen in society that there are still spaces that are all guys, right? Like, you very few. And, and so, like, what is going on here? And, like, truly just bewildering. And, um, so yeah, it's something I just talked about a lot as I was going through the process of, of developing Wingspan and, and, um, and continued after it came out for sure. Well, why, why do you think that is? Like, like, let's talk about the beginning. Like, why is it? I mean, first of all, everybody loves games, right? Whether you're a boy yeah. or a girl, you play uh, hopscotch, you play hide and go seek, you play tag, you play right. whatever. So why is it that we seem to have lost that as we're kids since boys, girls play every kind of game together? But once it comes to the table in the Euro games, why does it seem like the women have dropped off from that? Have, have you thought about that at all or wondered why? I have. I've thought about it a lot. Um, and I think there's a lot going on. I mean, first of all, I think it's it's more extreme in public spaces than in private spaces. I think if you, I, there's not good research on this, but my impression is if you looked at the number of people who just play games at home, you would find more women than you find going to conventions or game nights. And I think some of that has to do with like the distribution of labor in people's households and the fact that women get stuck watching the kids where the, while their husbands go to game night. Okay. Um, at least that happens among a lot of people I know. Right. Um, and I think that there's just a lot of historical stuff going on. I mean, some of the theme stuff that we were talking about before, like, Games are, in their representation, or can be very male-oriented, um, you know, sometimes exclusively male characters. If there are female characters, they might not be portrayed in a way that's, like, with any agency or empowerment. They're just, like, male gaze, girl in bikini kind of characters. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so many other reasons <laughs> I don't, so i i think there's some history there just in terms of like game groups and the feeling i talked about of like walking into a room and being alarmed to be the only woman there like i think that that can create self-perpetuating cycles where then the like the only woman that shows up doesn't come back because she was uncomfortable and then that just like yes creates a cycle where you can never get someone to stay and so you know, and that easily could have happened to me in playtesting. I find it's, a, it's, I feel like the designer world lags behind the gamer world by a few years, right? Because designers are sort of pulling from the pool of gamers that got really into gaming so much that they wanted to design a game. Mm -hmm. And so, like, I, I feel like when you go to a playtesting convention, it's even more male than a Gen Con, for, for example. Um, but I just, I ended up just getting stubborn about it and being like, I'm just going to push through and just do this. Uh, and, you know, I think we're getting to the point where enough women are starting to do that. Um, that once you get a critical mass, it's not as uncomfortable to walk into the room. And I think we are several years behind that cycle with women on, you know, getting people of color to feel comfortable coming in and staying and similarly behind on sort of the representation in the games when you look at them and whether you feel like was this a board game that like even expects me to play it right right um no, I so, think, yeah. and, and the thing about it is um when you look at even like say a, a local game store for instance which i own a board game cafe right. i don't do magic i don't do tabletop like warhammer 40k I just do 95% board games, 5% D&D. And one of the things why I've sort of kept to that, and I've noticed that, is because if you just, for me personally, it's just my thinking, that board games alone, you know, the Monopoly story, um, you know, Trivial Pursuit, whatever we've grown up with, and, you know, just board games, those are for everybody. Like, yeah. there's not a sort of uh, uh, stereotypical kind of crowd that migrates or gravitates towards um, just playing board games like they do say for Magic or the tabletop board games and all that kind of stuff. So that's why even in my place, I feel the audiences are more diverse. 
uh, with the gender, especially with when it, men and women, because it is for everybody. I'm, I'm there. Yeah. I just have board games. And, and, and I think yeah. that might be a problem, too, because it is true that not a lot of women necessarily do do the hardcore tabletop Warhammer 40K or Magic as well, right? Yeah, that's my impression. It's, it's neither of those are games that I've really played with at all. So I don't, I'm not super familiar with the audience. But yeah, I've certainly heard um, from friends of mine who are women who play Magic that it is um, not, it, you really have to pick and choose the places that you play Magic. Yeah. <laughs> um, because sometimes you can end up in communities that are just not welcoming to women at all. Right. No, absolutely. I would definitely agree with that. And then also um, with the you know incident with George Floyd on May 25th and all that kind of stuff, uh, you took it upon yourself after that, which I appreciate and thank you very much. You uh, made a uh, page on your website called Black Voices in Gaming. And it was great. And, and, and please, I just want to let the audience know and I want to give you a lot of credit because this is something, again, I could have done, anybody could have done. We all had the ability to do this, right? To make a sort of resource to let the gaming industry and community know, hey, there are these people there, just like you had done with the women, right? You had, you, you had done right. your women, in, but to let people know, hey, yes, there are people of color, there are black people in gaming, let's make a resource so you can find them, see them, make them become visible. So I want to applaud you about that, but Thanks. But 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 it, no, because I, I think it's very good. Again, we we all could have done it. Anybody could have done it. It's just either I, you know, when I say we, I'm including myself. We're just lazy. Nobody did it. But, <laughs> well, <laughs> and you know, I had the experience of having done that. The list of women that you mentioned on my website, which came out of you know my experience with Wingspan, was a lot of times I got covered as like you know, the one of the only women who's designing board games, which is kind of true compared to the like, thousands and thousands of men that are designing board games. But yeah. but there are hundreds of women on the, that list at this point. Like the, calling me one of the only is a little bit of an exaggeration. Like there are a bunch of women who are designing games and it was very frustrating to me that like, that n people didn't know about them. They weren't getting asked to do, you know, interviews like this and, and things like that. and. The other part that I think, so the, the Black Voices in Gaming started as me starting a Twitter thread of like, here are the people that I know, who else is out there that I just don't even know, like everyone should be following these people, let's amplify their voices right now. And, um, but one of the things that I really found with the list of women is that sometimes it just makes me feel so good to scroll through and like see everyone's pictures and just like, I don't know, I get this visceral reaction to that. And so I wanted to, create that same style of page with people's pictures and like having everyone be there on a single page, because I think there's some power in that. Oh no, there definitely is. There definitely is because, because of what you have done, um, I took it upon myself to start reaching out to these people because it's the same, oh, thing, right? Because yeah. I'm the people you put on your page. So thank you. But all of a sudden I was like, because it, the fact is, when I go to conventions, and I've been to all of them, Gen Con, Essen, Origin, whatever, you know, it's the same thing. There aren't a whole lot of people who look like me, but now all of a sudden I had it. So I started tweeting uh, or looking on their Twitter page, websites, phone calls, Facebook. Hey, nice to meet you. I didn't know you were, you know, boom, boom, boom. So it's good that now awesome. I get, yeah, yeah, get to meet people. So it, it's, it's really good. And then, you know, talking about this also, about both men and women, I would just like to talk real quick about something that I saw on your Twitter page, and I just want to go ahead and um, read this real quick. So you wrote, tell me about a time that you walked into a room and were visibly in the minority, ergo, by race or gender. How did it make you feel? Did you stay? Were you more or less likely to come back? If you can't think of a time that you have had this experience, please just listen. I think that's very profound because uh, I, 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 my situation is a little bit different. I grew up literally the only black person in my entire town for like pretty yeah. much my life. Um, so I can relate to that directly. And I think it's very profound. Have you noticed being a white person, also a female, but have you noticed more of, and you know what I mean when I say your people or white people, like, you know, <laughs> you know people that you associate with, have you noticed them coming more and more to an enlightenment and starting to listen? 
I think so. I think uh, I think a lot of people are starting to do the work and you know do a lot of reading and and um, I was really struck. You know, there were some clueless responses to that question but there were also a bunch of white guys who replied and said yes you know i was in the military it was very common for me to be the only white guy in the room but i realized at some point that i was the one with power in the room even though i was in the minority and i tried to always like watch myself because of that and to not exploit that like you know just that extra level of awareness of like not just oh i was the only person of my race in the room and yes it was uncomfortable but like yes it was uncomfortable so that gives me some empathy and i still realized that i had privilege in that situation right like that's i feel like that's another level of analysis that i haven't seen as much as i saw in this thread just in the last couple of days Right, right. No, it is very good. And I read a response where there was a white male from Europe, and he said, hey, being a white male less on under 50, I think he said, in Europe, he goes, okay. never. Yeah. You know, so, um, yeah, it is good bringing awareness, and I'm glad you're sort of slapping people in the face with these questions. <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully, even if it's one, two people, that little by little, people will listen, realize, and start to have a personal awake yeah yeah and i i mean i think it's some people need to hear the stories over and over and that was sort of my goal with with asking the question right it was just like because there are some stories on there and there's some people that didn't tell stories that were just like yeah every single game event i've ever been to like right. yeah yes. it just sucks yeah yeah, and it's one of those kind of things that's good because I, it, it does make, I hope, people stop and think. Because, again, for somebody like me, that's just, just my whole life. Like, 95% of my life is where I am kind of the only one or in a very small minority in the large minority. So I hope a lot of people do stop and think about that. Um, and what has been the reaction from um, the gaming community to these kind of things you're doing? Do you feel that you are sort of a rebel and there's a little bit of pushback or have people been like, you know, Hey, go girl, or, you know, do your thing, you know, supportive. I'm just wondering how, and I'm sure they've been a little bit of both, right. Yeah. On both sides, but, but what has been the general feeling and, 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 and how do you feel about the responses? I'd say more positive than not. I mean, there's, there's always going to be people that are like, man, I don't, I don't see color. I don't pay attention to the, the, the name on the game box what I'm like okay you're clearly like whatever <laughs> but, but I don't, like sometimes I'll engage and sometimes I just let it go right um but uh but they're the minority for sure and I think people are are coming along and you know there's still a lot of work to do I think there's there's a vast amount of work to do between like okay now people are sort of acknowledging that there is this problem or that it is a problem that there is such a uh, imbalance of demographics in this hobby world compared to like the demographics of the country that we live in like okay so if we do start to agree that that's a problem like what then right <laughs> like right um because it's one thing to to recognize it and that's an important first step but um figuring out what what to do next about it is a whole separate set of of issues um one of the things in the in the design space that's happening is that there are a couple of programs that have started up that have uh scholarships for designers to attend different uh conferences so one is one of at least the two that I know about. One is for the Tabletop Network Conference, which historically has been <laughs> aligned with um, BGGCon in Dallas in the fall, and then um, the other one that had just started up and then um, hasn't actually awarded any scholarships yet because Unpub got canceled. Is for Unpub in Baltimore in the in the spring. Um, so obviously that stuff's all kind of on hold right now while we're not meeting in person. But I I do think that. Yeah, you know, in addition to race and gender being barriers in a variety of ways that we talked about, just like the financial cost of going to some of these events is a is a serious barrier for some people. So to be able to 
to acknowledge that and to, to help some people come to events that wouldn't normally make it, I think can help create some of the relationships like you were talking about and, and, um, and just expose people at the events to other points of view as well, because with, with at, like, I was at Tabletop Network this past fall and, and I think the scholarship brought in like 10 people and it, that sh noticeably changed the demographics of that room. Like it would have been a heavily, heavily white male room without those 10 people. And, um, and I, I think that in and of itself has some value as you're sort of brainstorming came into ideas and talking about sort of the future of game design, like having different people's perspective um, can, can really change that conversation. Oh, absolutely. Diversity of thought is something a lot of times people don't think about um, because when they set, say the word diversity, all of a sudden they either think color or gender, but diversity of thought too, because the diversity of color and gender will bring in that diversity of thought, right? Right. So, right. Um, Right. So here's a question, and um, and uh, I I want you to kind of think about this a little bit. So because you are Elizabeth Hargrave, okay? I mean, uh, it, it's 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 quite no, it, no. It, and what I mean, is, it, it, <laughs> and, it, and it's kind of flattering, you know. And, and again, you, you deserve <laughs> all of this, Elizabeth, because you know you you made a tremendous impact in the gaming industry. But anyway, what I'm what I'm trying to say is because you are Elizabeth Hargrave and you've reached those heights. You are now like worldwide recognized, blah, blah, blah. So now when you are sort of the voice for women or the most visible woman, I want to say, game designer in the world, do you make sure as a responsibility, maybe you haven't thought of this, I don't know, but that you, like you have done with your Women in Gaming page, that you make sure that what you say isn't, sort of the woman stamp or the woman voice mm. or that you are still making sure that other women are being noticed and heard and you have by your page but i just want to make i just want to ask you is that something you're constantly aware of yourself because of the the heights you have achieved mm -hmm. um yeah, I mean, it's something I try to do. I could probably do better at it in terms of like always trying to bring people along with me. But yeah, it's it's definitely something I'm aware of, and I'm and I try to acknowledge sometimes when I'm you know speaking from on high about the role of women in in board games that not everyone has had the same experience as me. But you know, it's hard to always remember to do it. I try. Yeah, I know it's got it's got to be. And again, yeah. it's, it's it's one of those kind of things where it, it, it's tough because you have taken this responsibility. And again, I, I applaud right. for it. It's fantastic, but it is. It's it's sort of again not your responsibility, right? Right, but, right. I mean, it's something I care about enough that, like, I know some people are like, oh, you know, don't ask me about that again. I'm like, I'm just tired of talking about it and being expected to be the representative of my, you know, demographic group. In my case, because I've been so vocal about it, I think it's, you know, I'm happy to talk about it. It's, I think it's totally reasonable for people to ask me about it. Like, I don't have that same reaction of like, oh, please stop asking me about this. Like, I, I, I'm still, at this point at least, I'm still like, no, we got to talk about this, right? right, right, right. Um, yeah, yeah, but no, and, and it's great. And again, thank you. Like I said, it's just, it's really helped. So please, anybody, if you're wondering about uh, some of the things I brought up or talked about, for example, if you go to, I believe it's E-L-I-Z-Hargrave.com, right. not correct? Right. If you I have go a to very Facebook, long name. Yes, I hope you do. No. <laughs> 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 so ElizHargrave.com. Uh, right. There are two pages. One that is, uh, I don't know, it's women. Um, what's the exact title, I'm sorry, of the page? Women designers. Oh, like women and non-binary designers. Or I don't know. I'd have to look. I women don't know. Well, yeah, you're bringing up <laughs> group two of the non-binary. And then also the page. Uh, which I was flattered to be on, Black Voices in Gaming, because I was under there under business owners, but you have it cut down to uh, designers and artists and you know uh, 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 content creators and all that kind of stuff. But it's just a good resource where you can be like, wow, look at all these other women. Here are women resources. Wow, look at all these minorities. There are minority resources. So thank you very much for doing that. It's really good. So please go to elizhargrave.com to check that out. It's, it's very good resources. Um, so now I'd like to go ahead and shift a little bit and I want to find out more and let the audience know a little bit about 
Elizabeth Hargrave. So where did you grow up and where are you from? Mm. I bounced around a little bit when I was growing up. So first LA and then Southern Illinois. And then in seventh grade, my family moved to Gainesville, Florida and, and they've been there ever since. So oh. mostly I say I grew up in Florida, but it's really only since seventh grade. <laughs> So do you consider yourself a Southern girl? Uh, were you you were born in the West Coast? The West, like what? What? Yeah. Do you, and my, pa as, my parents are Yankees, so like culturally, I was not raised as a Southerner at all. Oh, okay. But um, where? But, where, are from, where from? Where from the North? Uh, my mom was from Illinois and New Hampshire, and my dad was from New York, up, upstate New York. Okay, because I'm from Connecticut. That's what I was asking. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I'm a New Englander myself. Uh, <laughs> okay, so you moved around in Jacksonville, I guess, is pretty much where you had your formative years. Would that be Gainesville. a fair Yeah, which is about 90 minutes southwest of Jacksonville. Okay. So now, uh, were, did you play games in school? Were you a gamer? Um, hmm. Some. I mean, growing up, like so, some of the mass markets that like we always had, you know, and Scrabble and, and that kind of stuff. Um, I had a little brother who was eight years younger than me. So sometimes that would be sort of like a common denominator that we could play Uno or whatever, you know. Well, come on, Elizabeth, be honest. You just beat him up, right? Because he was young. <laughs> <laughs> I had to make the babysit him a lot, so we, you know, I was, I had to entertain him somehow. <laughs> um, yeah, and a, and a lot of card games. Like my friends and I played a lot of gin rummy and, and hearts and spades and stuff like that. And, oh, um, wow. Yeah, I didn't really find hobby board games till about two thousand five. Well, okay. So now we're we jumped up to 2005. How how did that happen? Like you did go. How how did you find the hobby gaming or the Euro gaming? How did that happen? Yeah. So I was on a ski retreat with folks from my Unitarian church, <laughs> and someone brought a bunch of games. Um, and I, being having grown up in Florida and other places in the South, I actually am not like a big winter outdoorsy person. So I was very happy to play the board games. <laughs> I I was so oh, oh, hold on a second. You uh, said you're not a big outdoorsy person? Winter. Winter outdoors. Oh, winter outdoorsy. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Winter is gaming time. Yes. Okay. Yes. That's right. <laughs> okay. yeah, absolutely. That's why my wife and I live in Las Vegas now. because yeah, we right. Please, no snow. No snow for us. Uh, but yeah, so okay, and what was like the first experience or maybe the first couple games were all of a sudden, because it's happened to all of us, right? My first was Catan, my second was Puerto Rico, and after that I was just like all in. Was there like yeah. sort of a uh, evolution for you for the first couple games? I mean, that it was that weekend, and I don't remember what order I played them in, but the, there was definitely Carcassonne, there was Ticket to Ride, I think. There was definitely Blockus, I remember. Uh -huh. Settlers of Catan was either that weekend or very soon after. Oh. Um, yeah, so kind of that set of, st that era of board games all at once. Oh, nice. Okay. And so, like, let's yeah. bring it up to the present time, um, or back before, say, Wingspan or whatever. Where do you currently reside? Um, I live in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. Okay. So, and Silver Spring, Maryland. Do you have a full-time job, or are you a full-time game designer? I am a full-time game designer. Hey, congratulations! <laughs> <laughs> fantastic, right? So, okay, okay. So, I, I want to go back a little bit then. Did you become a full-time game designer because of the success of Wingspan? And that was able to be so lucrative and very fortunate and very lucky. And Not lucky, but I mean, you put in the hard work, of course, but you know, it's, it's great for you. Um, or was it in the process before Wingspan? It, I was closed before Wingspan. I I was well paid as a consultant and was very close to having enough money to save up to just being able to quit. Oh, very good. Uh, so yeah. tell us a little bit about when you say consultant, what, what did you do? What, what, what did you do? Um, I did health policy work. So I, I first came to D.C. to work for the Department of Health and Human Services okay. and um, worked on Capitol Hill for several years after that doing health policy stuff. A lot of Medicare. So like figuring out how to make the Medicare program better. I was working a lot on when they added a prescription drug plan to Medicare. So when the past was not the one I worked on, but um, that was something I spent a lot of time on. 
Right. And um, and so after I left Capitol Hill, I just became a consultant and I did a lot. I, I went back to doing more sort of the research side. Um, so I would do a lot of data analytics, but also a lot of um, qualitative research. I did a lot of focus groups with Medicare beneficiaries and interviews with physicians and, and people like that who serve Medicare beneficiaries. Um, which strangely, I feel like translated really well into the playtesting process and sort of being able to um, to get responses from people that were really what they were really thinking and, and that sort of thing. So, okay. yeah. And so since Wingspan was your first design, um, you're working in health policy, you're an avid gamer, at, what, what was the point where you're like, okay, when you put pen to paper, uh, if you can kind of bring us back to that first point where Elizabeth was like, okay, you know what? I'm going to make my own game. What, what kind of happened there? It really was a conversation where we were like, what's with all the castles and trains? And like, why are there no games about anything that we like? So this was like with my husband and a couple other friends. And, and um, yeah, and so I was already a burner at that point. Point and, and getting into it more actually um and so that just occurred to me I, I was thinking a lot about sort of the economic systems that you see in games and sort of you know the resources that you're then investing in in building something else and thinking about how you could easily translate those systems into sort of natural economic systems in terms of like the food the birds eat and and you know having there be costs for things and and building up engines and things like that so yeah that was sort of where i was where i was at okay, now, now, were you um how how much of of the actual um uh study of the birds did you know because since you are an average birder um did you have to look up or did you know a lot of the birds? You know what I mean? Like all the information. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, for the very first deck, I probably did like pick birds that I knew better, but I still broke out my field guide and was like, cause like even on that very first draft, I already had the wingspan. It was not calling it wingspan, but I, I did have that as one of the things you cared about on the birds. And, um, and so that was the kind of thing that like you don't you don't hold that information in your head, right? But yeah, and yeah, you know, sometimes I knew what they ate and sometimes I didn't, and I'd have to look it up, that kind of thing. Okay. So, and you're working yeah. now, now again, maybe you want to give us a little insight. I don't know. Um, is the uh ratio, say for instance, of like the eggs um or the sort of point value of the birds and all that kind of stuff, it is that like generally accurate to the actual bird in the wild do you know what i mean like yeah the point value has more to do i mean the point value has all kinds of things to do with like how much it costs in the game and that like that's very arbitrary and some of them are related to how much i like the bird okay <laughs> so like i made some birds more expensive because i liked them and i wanted them to be worth more points <laughs> oh yes creative, creative they're able to do that yes um but the eggs the number of eggs in the egg limit on the bird cards is not the actual number of eggs that the bird lays, but they are proportionate. Okay. So if a bird lays a lot of eggs in wingspan, it lays a lot of eggs in real life, but like sometimes some of them go up to like 20 a year or something. So that, that wouldn't have meant anything as a limit. So I sort of scaled them all down, but okay. now, yeah, in, they're proportionate. It, so in, in the, what you say, um, or what the question would be, what do I want people to get out of this game? Um, how would you rate if I were to give you two choices? Okay, I'm gonna give you I'm gonna give you two choices, Elizabeth. I'm gonna say good gameplay, or I want people to learn my passion for birds. How would you weigh those two? Um, it's a really good question. I mean, I would say that my vision for it from the beginning was always that I wanted both. Okay. But I knew that it couldn't go anywhere without the good gameplay. Of course, right? Yeah, it has to. So I is. think like that is like a, a notch ahead just because I knew that that would be the legs that it could stand on. Yes, um, and, and, and I think it's great. The, the engine building to me is one of the most um, sort of intuitive and most gratifying mechanics, especially to sort of new gamers 
to get mm. into a game. And that's why Wingspan has become one of uh, our at the cafe sort of go to intro uh, games because it's it because engine building is intuitive and gratifying. Um, mm. and it's a wonderful job of that. And it's kind of simple with your mechanic. It's just like just move from right to left, right? So mm -hmm. you just along the way, and it's and it's very good. So how long the process? Was it from say inception to final, or was it pretty smooth? Because, for instance, Alan, uh, <laughs> his first prototype was like 90% there. How about for you in that process? No, we, uh, yeah, it was a very long development process before I pitched it, and then more development after I started working with Jamie for sure, for sure. And a lot of the engine building is what we really worked on together. Um, sort of pushing that and pushing that until it got to somewhere where it was so satisfying and smooth. Um, yeah, that was, it was definitely um, a, lo a long process and a lot of iterations. Okay, so, okay, so when you went yeah. to Jamie then and you pitched it for him and he was like, okay, yeah, I see there's something here. Can you maybe tell the audience a little bit, how does that relationship work or how does it get started? Like how does, how does he, I, you probably can't speak for him, but I mean, realize, yes, I've got something here and be able to take your vision along with his and work it together. So how, how was that whole process for you with that? Yeah, I really can't speak to like, how did he realize that this could go somewhere? Um, I mean, I thought it was ready to pitch because I felt like it was at a point where people were starting to ask me, even in that stage before I you know, went through all the development that made it what ended up being Wingspan, even at that stage, people were like, I would buy this net, like today. Can I buy your prototype? You know, like, wow. so I, that, that's when I knew it was pitchable. Um, and then for Jamie, that like, I, I think he did see something in the unique theme that he thought could go somewhere that he hoped would go somewhere. Um, and then, yeah, just the, you know, it, it had the primordial stages of the engine building. Right, but right. honestly, the whole right to left thing, like that was all after I started working with Jamie and, and came from a brainstorm about, um, Deus, actually, if you've played that, has a similar system where you're playing out cards and then you get to periodically like reactivate them as you're adding to them. So, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. So, so I because I'm just because the whole thing I was wondering again. Yeah, you can't really uh, speak for Jamie or what he was thinking, but there had to be a point where you were like, yeah, like this is this is the right guy. Like he he sees. Oh, for that, yeah. Yeah. So he knows where I want to go, and I feel really good with this relationship. So, did that come? at say the point of, okay, Jamie, I'm gonna do this, or was it like a little bit later in the process? You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, as, as a designer, you don't always have a ton of say in the matter, right? Like you kind of, you'll work with what publisher will take you. <laughs> um, to a certain extent, I did do a lot of research ahead of time, just trying to figure out who to pitch to because I knew that the theme was going to make it a hard pitch and that a lot of companies just like it wouldn't fit in their catalog. Um, and so there was something about Jamie's games between like between two cities and, and um, Viticulture that kind of made me think like there, there might be something there that, that would make him, you know, open to this theme. Um, and I knew, I know Matthew O'Malley personally, I actually play test with him a lot, who designed Between Two Cities. So I knew that he had had a good experience working with Stone Meyer. Um, so that, that helped me feel comfortable going in. And then it was really, you know, and Jamie had also has just a very personable public presence. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that helped too. And then, yeah, it was really just working with him after that, 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 you know, we, we built up a really good working relationship where we could be very productive in the development process. Well, I mean, it just goes to show it was obviously the right choice because it's, <laughs> it, no, it is. It's a perfect designer, publisher, whatever secret sauce, whatever came together. It was just magical. It, it, uh, really was. I mean, you deserve all the credit for that. So I was also reading a little bit about you and what's the deal with your fascination with mushrooms? Oh, they're just really cool. What's the deal with it? I don't 
Why are you not interested in mushrooms? They're amazing. No, I, I, don't know. Know. I love mushrooms. I mean, like whether I do pizza or like uh, sandwiches or whatever, I I always I love mushrooms. So is it is it is it for eating? I take it right. Um, I mean, I, I, there's lots of mushrooms that I think are just really pretty. In the, I mean, it, it, it's so I'm married to someone who is a naturalist sort of by self-training and who leads a lot of um, nature walks and who um, did landscape design for many years and like knows all of the plants in the forest, right? And then, so I learned a lot of that by osmosis just from going hiking with him a lot. And then once he knew all the plants, he started working on all the mushrooms. <laughs> you, know, you gotta know it all. Right, right, right. Uh -huh. um, no, but they're just, I mean, they're super cool organisms. It's a whole different sort of, I don't know, it's literally like a separate kingdom, right? To, to explore it. And, do you grow them to display like you do flowers? I mean, or like, is it, do you collect them to just eat or? Like, what do you do with like uh, a lot of things? I mean, there are there are some species that people have figured out how to how to cultivate, right? Like shiitakes, a lot of people grow, and and um, you can buy little kids to to grow oyster mushrooms. Um, but mostly, it's it's foraging in the woods. Um, so right now in in the DC area, it's chanterelle season. Uh, so they are like a prized culinary mushroom, right? And we've probably harvested God, at least. 10 pounds by now of, of chanterelles. So we've just been like eating them in every meal. Very nice. <laughs> like chanterelle omelets, chanterelles and pasta. Ch you know, like, it's just fun. It's another way to connect with, with the woods and like not just be passively walking through, but like actually engaging with what's there. Uh -huh, yeah, absolutely. So what is a perfect, or not a perfect, but what is the preferred game night for Elizabeth? Like um, you have friends over, um, do you always break out wingspan your game or what are some <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'm actually still happy to play it. If someone wants to play wingspan, like, you know, I've taught lots of my friends and, and, oh, um, sure. and I'm still happy to play it. Like I, there was a point when we were like wrapping it up and it was going to the printer that I would not have played it. I was done. Oh, needed a break. Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I, I will play Wingspan. Um, but no, like, I don't know. I, the weight of Wingspan is probably like the, the weight that is easiest for me to get to the table with my group of friends that I came with. Like, that's a very comfortable spot for them. Um, when I go to conventions, sometimes I'll like, there's the world's merge and like do something heavier because I know I can't get other people to, to play it with me at home uh -huh. um or the and there's a game night kind of in my neighborhood that um at a, at a local diner where there's a bunch of guys that like like to break out the heavy stuff that i'll i'll go chew on that with them but i am also super happy to do you know the lighter and even you know much like like just one i've probably played more than anything else in the last year right like i really good very much an omni gamer. The only thing I won't play is um, social deduction games. I hate them. Oh, really? You don't like them at all? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they make me just like really. I, I hate the li I hate lying and being lied to. Oh, and it's okay, yes. Very uncomfortable. And and actually, I love deduction, like logical deduction mm -hmm. games. Like I loved Mastermind when I was a kid, and. Um, so you must love I, the unlocks and those big games and stuff like that. Do you like things like that? Or is Sherlock Holmes and things Yeah, like that? right, right. I actually was just playing Sherlock Holmes a couple of weeks ago at the beach. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so I think also the first time that I played a social deduction game, I didn't realize that it wasn't a logical deduction game. And so then that disconnect just, like, really turned me off. <laughs> like, there's no real information to work with, right? Mm -hmm. They just play um, out lying. whatever lying and guessing. Right? Yeah, that's exactly right. Just lying and guessing. <laughs> so we're getting close to the end here. Um, and thank you for taking the time here. But real quick, what do since you are a full time game designer now that that that's got to feel good, right? I mean, is were you happy to achieve that, and are you happy doing that now? Yeah, like, I mean, it's been weird in the pandemic because it's totally changed. Um, 
So like I have a group of folks that I usually play test with once a week in the middle of the week. And that's totally like gone. And the only play testing that's really happening is on tabletop simulator, which just to me is not the same. You can figure some stuff out mechanically, but like like I talked about before with my research job, like part of the thing that I feel like I do well at playtesting is like reading the room and figuring out what people are really thinking. And like, you cannot do that on tabletop simulator. Um, so that's really thrown me for a loop. And so I have not gotten a ton done in the last few months. We wrapped up, like I had a bunch of work still to do on Oceania for, for Wingspan. Um, so I've been working on that, but other stuff, like I, I have not been, working on as much but um but yeah i i mean the the design community here in dc has been just an amazing resource and there's um in normal times just a ton of playtesting going on and really smart people um so i just i feel really lucky to have had that to help launch me in doing all of this oh very good but what can we expect i mean i don't know how much you want to reveal, can reveal, or whatever, but uh, as much as you can, if you don't mind, can you please let us know what we can expect from Elizabeth Hargrave coming up in the near future? So I do have one other game that was signed a while back that's in development right now, um, and that is one of the publishers not talking about their sort of going the Stonemeyer route of being very close-lipped until it's all ready to go. Okay. Um, sure. but that it, that's another like meaty hero game. Um, I have Tony Mussey, which is, sorry? I was just wondering, um, if you can't talk about the game, can you maybe give us an expected date when it might be available, or not even that? I don't even know. You don't even but know? Pan yeah, Pandasaurus put out a press release that we're doing it, but they didn't say anything about what it is. Yeah, okay. so but it's with Pandasaurus. Yeah, um, and then I have, I have Tussie Mussey with, um, with Button Shy Games, so they do 18 card games as their thing that they do. And so Tussie Mussy is a, a little I Split You Choose um, card game that, that came out with Butt and Shy. And we've actually been talking about an expansion for Tussie Mussy. Oh, very uh, nice. Which is a very different thing to wrap my head around than, a, than Wingspan expansions because, you know, you're starting with the 18 cards and then an expansion that's less than 18 cards. But, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's been fun to think about, to, you know, think of, about a new set of uh, stuff and, and some different dynamics in that one. So that's 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 been one that I've been working on the pandemic. That's sort of the scale that I'm working at right now. Okay. Oh, very good. Very good. <laughs> um, and last but not least, if you don't mind, if you could real quick, I'm just going to go ahead and, uh, you know, put you up on the screen there. Please let everybody know where they can uh, get everything and anything Elizabeth Hargrave, your Twitter, your website, Instagram, and all that kind of stuff, and just let them know where they can get information on you. Yeah, most of it's, at, um, well, so my website is elizhargrave.com, like Tim said, and then um, the same exact Twitter handle. I'm on Instagram, I think, at the same name, but I hardly ever go on there. <laughs> so mostly it's, mostly it's Twitter. Um, yeah, my email is elizhargrave at, at gmail.com. So it's all the same across all the different platforms. Right. Okay, good. Well, that's how you can go ahead and follow Elizabeth. You yep. can check her out. And um, again, she's very, uh, again, what's going on with the Black Lives Matter movement, the women, uh, um, I guess, gender, also you could say, um, with non-binary too, um, and women in gaming and stuff. Uh, she's very proactive with that. You can uh, hear her thoughts, hear her comments on Twitter. She goes ahead and does that. Um, check out the pages and all that kind of stuff. But again, I just want to, first of all, thank you for taking the time to do this with me. I really appreciate that. And also, again, thank you for creating the platform, creating the resources for both women non-binary and for Black Voices in Gaming to let the gaming world know that we are out there. Uh, there are others out there who aren't necessarily in the plurality, majority, whatever you want to say, uh, but the lower represented voices in gaming um, I'm going to speak for all of us. I don't care. <laughs> well, thank you. So I'm not buying, I'm not non binary or I'm not a woman, but I am black. But I'm just going to say <laughs> thank you from all of us. It's, it's just so great what you're doing. 
And um, and please, I would like to be an ally to you to offer help. Um, if I can maybe um, assist in helping you you do your work. Um, because again, uh, the, the fact is you are you are who you are. You you have achieved that and it's great. And you should be proud of it and honored all the hard work you put in. So again, I would just like to be able to offer my services to help you do that in whatever I can to assist you as well. Well, thank you, Tim. Yes, absolutely. All right. Well, thank you folks uh, very much for joining us for another episode here of Meeple Meet Meets. Uh, we will definitely have a show up for you every week. Uh, but again, I want to thank Elizabeth Hargrave one more time for joining us. Go out and get her game, Tussie Mussy. Uh, wingspan, and hopefully um, toward the end of August, we will be able to purchase Mariposas. We do have uh, about two dozen of them coming into Meepleville, so we'll be able to get one there. But again, thank you one more time for joining us here on Meepleville Meets. We'll see you soon.